Welcome to episode seven of Core Talk. It is July 2020, another month of pandemic, another month of COVID, and we are still working to deliver the mission. I'm your host, Patrick, and with me is your other host, Andy. And this month we have a pretty full show, if I'm not mistaken, correct? We do, yeah. It's it just seemed like uh, we have we have a lot to say this month. Good things, um, but a lot to say. Yes. Yeah, we uh, well through the the pandemic uh, when we were doing the alternate care facility uh, site assessments and stuff, uh, we had our GAS team uh, out there and they developed a, a program that helped us get those assessment done. And I think you had, you had an interview. Uh, I don't think that they realize how big of an impact they were making for not only the Norfolk District, not only the North Atlantic Division, but also the the Army Corps of Engineers as a whole. And uh, what they did was they took an already available app that uh, operations uses, and they applied it in a way that expedited their ability to go and and look at these sites uh, and assess them which they we, we were kind of crunching the numbers and it came out to be uh, saving 86 man hours. So huge impact on the efforts there as far as saving time and moving forward with, with doing these site assessments. Yeah, and they got an award for that too, correct? Yeah, they did, <laughs> which is what kickstarted the, the whole idea for the segment. Yes, they did. They received an award um, from headquarters, the Innovation Award, uh, and pretty much the, the award was for improving the efficiency of the entire assessment uh, and reporting process and allowing a single integrated interactive and real-time data source for the region and the enterprise so now what's going on is what they developed uh, when they were doing their work is now being used throughout the army corps of engineers to provide a a worldwide emergency management response uh, one with which all the districts have been activated and required to collect data into GIS applications. So it's a pretty big deal. And I have uh, got the chance to sit down with um, Susan Layton, our chief of planning, and Holly Carpenter, one of our project managers. For those that don't know, uh, we are in the midst of doing three coastal storm risk management studies in the state of Florida, uh, which is normally covered by Jacksonville. But because of the amount of work that the Jacksonville district is doing, they needed some assistance. We had some capacity to help. So we have three studies that are ongoing. Uh, and we have released two of the reports. One's in the comment period. The other one is in, also in the comment period, but going through the virtual public meeting portion. So I got a chance to sit down with them and talk about uh, why we're involved. Uh, what we're doing, what those projects or what those studies are are looking at. And so that was a pretty good discussion. And you've got another segment, too, on on this episode uh, dealing with our contracting business folks, right? Yes. So uh, one of the toughest people to get a hold of is is probably Sherry Coons. She's in charge of uh, the small business operations. So I did get a chance to um, just tell um, tell me and our listeners what small business does because they do so much and they impact the community so greatly with their work. So it's a little, it's kind of a little teaser. So um, we could try to catch back up with her uh, in future episodes and and find out a little bit more. So I think that the listeners will enjoy that. So we're all remotely working uh, for the most part, but I actually made it into the building. That's huge. Yes, yes. So I made it into the Waterfield building, our headquarters building, and I can just tell you that what a a major change has occurred as they're prepping to eventually have people come back. You no longer have to use your your hands to open up like the bathroom door. They have foot poles now um, that's been installed. You know, hand sanitizer like all over the place. Um, you get your temperature checked. Our logistics staff is hard at work wiping everything down all the time, it seems like. And so I know that our chief of logistics has been really orchestrating along with the, our, our facilities manager there in the building to, to get everything prepped and have all the, the equipment on hand, the masks and, and the soap and everything else like that there so that, you know, when the employees do actually come back in a, in a larger force, that the building is ready for them. And in fact, our chief of logistics uh, won an award for how he handled the pandemic. And uh, we're going to be talking to him 
in the next episode. And I think that's going to be a really good episode, a really good segment, because logistics, they're kind of like the unsung heroes that keep everything moving. It's going to be nice to um, to give a little, little radio play to those folks who are definitely a, a much-deserved group of people. I, I'm looking forward to that. All of us were able to sit there and, and work from home. That's the one group that actually had to maintain operations in the building and could not, for the most part, effectively telework and stuff. So that'll be next month. So let's uh, look at this month. All right. We'll start with our Innovation Award recipients. And then let's move into your piece from the Florida Studies. And then we'll round it up with our small business segment, Great Places to Work, as well as uh, the news from around the, around the district. All right. Let's kick it off. While we were all at home and feeling helpless as COVID-19 swept over the country, a group from the Norfolk District was working against the clock to help Virginia fight an enemy that we'd never seen before. Erica Sparkman, a project manager, and Doug Hessler are two members of that team. Yeah, so on March 23rd, um, our engineering branch um, was starting to get together teams to do assessments for FEMA for um, creating alternate care facilities. Um, We knew that Virginia was looking for alternate care facilities in the Tidewater and Northern Virginia and Richmond regions, but we didn't yet have a list of facilities to assess. Uh, So we were just starting to get the teams together. We had received some information from the Center of Expertise Um, like conceptual layouts for alternate care facilities and a list of business rules that we should be looking for. Uh, We also received a a checklist that New York District had developed for uh, assessing uh, facilities for alternate care. So so let me ask you guys, well, we'll start with you, Erica. COVID-19 hits. I know at the district, we're like, we had no idea what was going on. What was it like for you when that tasking came down? Hey, we have a global pandemic and we need you to start helping us out. What did that, what was that like for you personally? Oh, it was definitely scary. Um, I have two young kids at home. They were at home, not at daycare. So um, our house was a little busy, but it was exciting to be able to contribute um, to a cause that was was super important and it was super important all right doug how about you when you um when you got got pulled into on onto this team and and we didn't quite know how big this was so there was a, a level of uh I, I think confusion maybe scrambling but what was it like for you uh yeah so i was kind of just uh working at home and i think ross uh uh contacted the GIS section and said, we're going out and we're doing these inspections. Uh, what can you do for us? And so that's kind of where the app started. Uh, as far as big picture for the project and finding these facilities, do, how much, how much information did you have before you were tasked to go out and find these alternate care facilities? I'll answer. So we knew, um, that some other districts had started doing this, um, specifically New York District. They were ahead of us. Um, So they had gone out and done assessments. And in fact, I think when we were starting our assessments, they were actually starting to construct an alternate care facility. So we had some lessons learned, but that's like one or two projects, not a whole lot. Um, And we knew that we were on a um, very short timeline. And so I think that's kind of where the Survey123 app came in. Um, It really expedited the process. So we knew we had to get these assessments done quickly. And um, by using the Survey123 app, we were able to move much faster than we would have if we were using just pen and paper. So, Doug, here's here's your part. Here's your time to shine, my friend. (laughs) Tell us. Tell us about survey one, two, three. And I want to know before using it for the alternate care facilities, what did you, what is the app and what would you normally use it for? Yeah. So uh, it's a app that's uh, 
it's for field work. Uh, it's form based. It can collect some location information, but it's it's mostly for making forms, which was perfect for this ACF or these care facility um, inspections. And luckily, like mm -hmm. Erica said, uh, New York had already started and they had made kind of a paper form or like a template. So we had a template to start off with. So we weren't completely uh, making it up as we go. Uh, so I, so the first thing I did, I guess, on that 23rd or 24th of March was took that New York form and brought it into survey one, two, three. And then we kind of went back and forth with the team, uh, adding some things, taking away some things. And the nice thing about the app is you can you can make drop down, so it keeps the data clean. Um, One really good example, I think, is that um, we were assessing two different types of facilities. So we had uh, an arena type of facility or a hotel type of facility, which could either have been a, a hotel or um, a dorm. We assessed a lot of dorms. And so I think that was actually one of the very first questions at the top of the uh, Survey123 app is, are we assessing an arena or are we assessing a dorm? And then from there, there are different fields that were required to be filled in. So Doug, you were saying as, as you were going forward and you were implementing the use of this app for the alternate, connect, uh, alternate care facility assessments, you were kind of kind of tweaking and 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 changing things as you were going along. Tell me a little bit about that process. What's an example of something where you're like, ah, I want to tweak this slightly to make this more effective and efficient for us? Yeah, so um, the app's pretty good uh, about being able to make updates on the fly. Uh, at first, we were being careful, like only doing it at night when we knew no one was really doing anything. But kind of throughout that, I kind of realized I didn't have to do that. So if if we did need a change, because we had two teams out there, uh, I was able to just kind of make that change and tell them, hey, uh, redownload the form. Um, yeah, so I think one of the uh, things kind of on that was probably Im implemented on day two or three was being able to pull information from other sources based on your location. So we were able to automatically populate whether it was in a flood zone, the address they were at, the city, county, the state was pretty obvious, but those kind of fields, just things that we were able to just automatically populate things that when you're in the field, you might like, you're not going to know if you're in a flood zone and if, and what flood zone uh, category you're in. So stuff like that, I think was really helpful. So eventually the form, uh, was combined with another form that was kind of floating out there more for reporting up to headquarters. Uh, that was Julie Vickers in the Vicksburg district. And so that's where it really kind of took off throughout the core is we had the field aspect of the app and then she had the what headquarters was using to report to the chief. Uh, those They called them EEIs. So eventually that got combined together to really become like kind of a cradle to grave thing for each facility. Now, had had this app been used in that manner any time before that you know of, or do you think this was the first time it, it, it functioned like that? It was definitely the first time a single app, a mobile app at least, was used across the core. In an emergency situation, it was definitely the first time, because most of our emergencies are hurricane, they're local or regional at, at most, and this was, probably the first emergency we had that was that was every single district. So we know it was the first time it was used across the core. Um, you were telling me a little bit before we started recording, how is this app being looked at now? Or what is the end result of the innovation of your team? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know that um, the districts are still doing um, facility assessments for um, FEMA alternate care facilities. But all of our um, 
vertical construction customers do facility assessments um, to determine what sort of maintenance is needed, when their building will have to be renovated, when it will have to be replaced, and they do that on a regular basis. And so I would think that uh, Survey123 could possibly evolve into something like that. Uh, and then, of course, I think the coolest thing is that we have all the data there for the facilities that we did assess. So um, if hopefully this doesn't happen, but if in the future there's you know another global pandemic and we have to um, think about more alternate care facilities, we already have the, the data there um, in the app, easy to access. And you had stated before that the North Atlantic Division was using this as kind of the template to go forward. Was I, am I correct in that? Uh, yeah, well, I think it's headquarters that used it as the template movement. Was it only NAD, Doug, or was it headquarters? No, it was the entire core. So eventually there was this, there was this whole spreadsheet mess and we had, there was a fusion cell up at Fort Belvoir that was like 10 to 15, captains and lieutenants kind of taking the 43 spreadsheets from every district. I guess divisions might have been consolidating a little bit and then putting it into one spreadsheet and then putting it into a PowerPoint. I mean, it was like 120 man hours every day. It just, it was, it was ridiculous. Um, and so eventually we, instead of everyone sending in their spreadsheets, they were just in, entering that information in the survey one, two, three, updating, the facilities like because the information was changing daily so that you could go back in and make edits to that facility record whether capacity uh the the, the process it was in within like the contract whether it was selected or if it was beginning construction all that sort of information so and i know this might be a hard um there's not a hard and fast number of doing the assessments. I know, Eric, you had said um, a total uh, of eight, uh, 86 facilities uh, were assessed with, within different different ranges. How would this number have been different if you hadn't, if you were using the old paper system? Uh, I'll answer um, just an estimate, though. We really don't know. But um, we did assess 86 facilities at different levels of assessment, so not all of them were full assessments. Uh, but I would, I would assume, you know, 30 minutes to an hour per um, facility would have been spent um, uploading data after the the facility assessment, um, you know, compiling notes and things like that, and sending them back to the district where we were preparing the actual assessment reports. Um, had it not been automated through the app, I think you could, yeah, you could have assumed uh, an additional 30 minutes or an hour for each facility. And it probably would have taken us longer to complete all of the assessments. And then on top of it, you have, you know, when you're dealing with actual paperwork or docs or PDF forms, you have more chance for things to get lost or not be downloadable or you know you have those other i would guess like glitches that that just come up with working with forms so you're kind of bypassing all of that as well um so oh, go ahead i was going to mention one other thing um we talked about how doug was able to update the app on the fly and the and the survey and that was not only because our teams were learning lessons in the field but also because the other districts were learning lessons in the field. So almost every day, um, the Huntsville Medical Center of Expertise would update their um, business rules. And, um, so, you know, they, they learned more. So they would update their assumptions and it would feed into um, how Doug updated the app. And so had we not had the app, we would have had to, you know, do all this either over email if we were lucky if vpn was working well or um you know making phone calls and and trying to do it without that automated process would have been more difficult when we were all kind of put on that you know maximum telework vpn our you know our net our ability to access our network uh was troublesome 
So, um, you know, what were some of the struggles that that you guys had while doing these assessments remotely and, and relying on these networks that were that could be spotty at times? Yeah, it was hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think at that point, um, ACIT had upgraded the VPN server, so we were starting to see an improvement, but it was it was still spotty. Um, some of us went into the office to work, um, but of course our teams that were out in the field couldn't go into the office. So that was the lucky part about um, uh, the app was that you didn't have to be on VPN. They could use their their mobile data. Doug, I'm going to uh, direct this one at you. So what were some of the um, um, challenges uh, that you found while you were doing the alternate care facility assessments, the whole process? The form ended up at the end having a lot of fields. So like, way, it probably was way too many fields. I don't know the exact number, but it was probably like 200 or something. So, and we were having every district and during all their facilities, I just looked, it was 1,150 facilities. You can imagine a, a thousand facilities with 200 fields. It's just because some of them were did have to be backfilled. It wasn't, you know, especially in NAD, a lot of the assessments had already been had already taken place, but headquarters still wanted all the information in in the app to report up. So it was kind of we had to define fields like, hey, these are the very important fields that need to be filled out. Um, and then along with that, defining the fields, that became a big, because we put the form together in a day. So we just had all these fields going in, but there were no definitions of, hey, what is, uh, I can't think of a good example, but there were a lot of things that just, they weren't intuitive. Like the, the, what, the form, what the question was asking, so we had to put definitions on a lot of things. And in the form, it, we were able to put hints under the fields and we also, published kind of a data dictionary to help with that. But that took an extra week or two to kind of get together. So kind of like streamlining the vernacular, make sure everybody was seeing, yeah. the, reading the words the same way. Yeah, making sure everyone was looking the, the same, same way. way. Yeah, exactly. Making sure we're all speaking the same language. Do you feel that, um, and so how do, how do you, how do you do that? How do you make sure the terms everyone was using and the way everyone was interpreting uh, those terms and situations, we were, they were all speaking the same language. Yeah, I don't know. I guess you try to define them. And I think for the important things that were getting reported, um, I think we did a pretty good job. Um, even in Norfolk District, we had two different teams out at the same time. So while they were collecting the same data, but essentially they were using the survey one two three form um there may have been different interpretations um and so back at the district we may have had to ask the teams the questions um our ross tuttle and alex gusev in operations branch were um, putting together the reports after the data came back from the teams and as we noticed that they were starting to ask the same questions of our teams over and over, that's when we went to Doug and said, hey, could you just put either um, a little note in here or expand upon the field that's in the survey one, two, three app? And I think it really streamlined the process. That's interesting because you do, you know, that's the human factor of things. How, how does person A interpret it versus, you know, person B? So that's, that's Erica, who was, who, Talk a little bit about the teams. How did it work? You said there were two teams. So how did that whole process happen and where did they go? Yeah, so uh, we had two teams out in the field at the same time. Um, we called, well, they called themselves the FEMA assessment teams, the FAT. Um, and the FAT 1 was in uh, Northern Virginia. They were led by Captain Cook. And FAT2 started out in Tidewater and then moved on to um, Richmond. So after we assessed all the facilities that uh, VDEM had provided in Northern Virginia, Tidewater, and Richmond, um, the teams kind of regrouped. They reorganized a little bit. And then they went out again to the Central Virginia region and um, Southwest Virginia region. 
Um, and about how many days or weeks was this? How long did all of this take place? Uh, a little less than two weeks. So um, like Doug mentioned, we uh, started developing the teams and then the uh, checklist for the app the 23rd and 24th of March. Our first facility assessment happened on the 25th of March, and then we were finished by the 4th of April. It's a pretty, uh, <laughs> it's a pretty grueling uh, uh, speed, I guess you guys are working at, huh? Yeah, very quick. The teams that were out in the field were were speedy. They were great. Yeah, so um, I have to be the first to admit that when uh, Doug and Ross and Alex came to me and said, oh, they, we have this Survey123 app we use in operations branch, we can use it for this. I thought, well, there's no way that something that they use in operations branch applies to a, a building condition assessment. The, you know, no way. Um, so I would say that we should all keep an open mind. And if if we have um, a need for something like this, go down to operations branch and, and um, see if they can help because they probably can. Well, hey, thanks so much for, um, you know, for, for spending some time and, and chatting about this. It's it's pretty interesting, um, you know, what you guys did and, and you're you're both very humble. But um, as we know, it was really important work for the district, the Commonwealth and, and what you guys did beyond. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to welcome to Core Talk our Chief of Planning, Susan Layden, and our Project Manager for the Miami-Dade Back Bay Coastal Risk Storm Management Study, Holly Carpenter. Welcome to the program. Good morning, Patrick. How are you? Oh, we're doing great. Good morning, Patrick. So let's just, uh, you know, we'll, we'll dive in and, and, and talk about, um, you know, what exactly is a, a feasibility study? And, and I think I'll direct that at, at you, Holly, since, you know, it's more you have direct impact on one of the studies we're doing multiples down in florida so uh you know for 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 the miami dade piece what what is that what is a feasibility study and associated programmatic environmental impact statement mean so what we've been charged with for the miami dade county area is to conduct a study over three years with a limited budget of three million dollars um, to look at what we can do as far as mitigation measures towards coastal storm risk management. And, and when I say we, I mean as a partnership, the federal government and the non-federal sponsor, Miami-Dade County. What is a feasibility study in this case? We're only looking at focused areas and hot spots as well as critical infrastructure countywide to address these issues. And through the three-year process, we're working on developing a plan that will be economically justified and have some preliminary designs so that we have a good handle on what the implementation um, costs and, and potential benefits could be. And, and at the conclusion of this, we'll have the documentation, which is the feasibility report integrated with that programmatic environmental impact statement that can be provided um, for approval through the Corps of Engineers and eventually, hopefully, um, to Congress for authorization for implementation. So. You know, Miami-Dade is just one of these studies. Uh, we have three other studies, and, and Susan, are they similar? Are, they, are there massive differences in these, these studies? So the, the studies are all under the same mission area of coastal storm risk management, but each study is definitely a bit unique. The <clears throat> Collier County study definitely uh, includes some beach area, um, which is a different than the, the Florida Keys and the Miami study. So that, that one looks at both the beach area and the back bay or the behind the beach area. Um, but it is a look at the entire county um, to start with, and then we zoned in on those areas of the highest risk. Uh, the Florida Keys, I would say, is just unique because of the geographic area of the Keys. I mean, you're talking about a uh, over 100 mile uh, string of islands that are very low lying, uh, very vulnerable to coastal storms. So I would say each of the studies start with the, the same mission um, of increasing resilience and reducing risk from coastal storms. 
Um, but then because of the uniqueness of each area, the, the outcome and the analysis is different for each. Uh, as we've already discussed Miami-Dade a bit, um, that is a very large and complex urban area. And they actually have a separate study that the Jacksonville District is doing for the beach area. So in that study, we're really looking at <clears throat> behind the beaches, so anything behind the ocean front. But even when we just look behind the ocean front, it was really more than we could um, completely and comprehensively provide a recommendation for within that three years and three million. So we did really zone in on, on hot spots and limited our analysis to that area. Um, whereas Collier and the Keys, we, we started out um, with, with the whole area um, to provide recommendations for. So there, so it's the same, same authority, but then we, you know, the outcome of each will be different based on the, the uniqueness of the, um, the, the geography, um, as well as the, the environmental resources are quite different on each, and that somewhat drives the recommendations that, that we can make for each study. And, and for you, Holly, um, we are in, you know, We've already released the, the study to the public. We're in a comment period. Um, what does that process look uh, going forward uh, to, the, to the general public? So what we're doing now, we're about 50% of the way through the study. We've released the draft report that includes a draft plan called the Tentatively Selected Plan. And we're really looking for um, public and agency feedback on that plan that we can incorporate into our refinement. Um, the remaining feasibility level analysis we have moving forward before we produce a final report next spring. And and I guess the, the main point here is is that you know this doesn't mean that you know when we complete the study projects start work start going. There's a whole other process that goes on after that, correct? So we'll be producing a final report next spring, and then by the fall of 2021. We're looking to seek approval within our agency, the Corps of Engineers, through a chief's report. Um, after that approval, the recommended plan from the study could then be passed through the administration and eventually be provided to Congress for consideration for authorization. And typically that's done in a Water Resources Development Act that occur on a biannual basis. Um, and then once it's authorized, that really provides permission to implement the study. But in order to actually start work, we would also need an allocation or federal funding in partnership um, with a non-federal sponsor since the implementation of this project would be cost shared. And, and, and Susan, I'll, I'll, you know, the next part of that question is, is, you know, so this is Florida, we're in Virginia, um, you know, at some point in time, you know, why are we involved in it? And then, you know, I, I realize that once we do the feasibility study, kind of our role gets diminished here in Virginia, as, as far as we know. And then our, our sister district, Jacksonville, would be the one actually, you know, performing the rest of the work, the actual physical construction oversight work. Am I, am I correct in that? Yes, you are correct. The eventual intent would be to turn the projects back over to the Jacksonville district for the pre-construction engineer and design or the PED phase of the project. Uh, so we have been working very closely with our district in the beginning studies to coordinate the steps along the way and to ensure that the recommendations that we're making and the potential or eventual implementation is consistent with how they see the projects moving along. Um, at, back to the question of kind of why is Norfolk District supporting the Jacksonville District? First, we're very honored and excited to be doing so. It's always uh, interesting to work in different parts of the country and certainly the, the risk in South Florida to coastal storms is really one of the highest in the nation, if not the world. Now, the Jacksonville District, of course, has a lot of coastline area responsibility, including uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, in addition to the, the Florida coast. So when the supplemental, the 2018 emergency supplemental appropriations were released, um, which included both general invest investigation studies as well as construction funding, there was a lot of work in that area. So in, in the core overall, we're moving to more regional and nationwide workload. So it was a great opportunity for the Norfolk District to be able to support the Jacksonville District as their teams had um, more than enough work to um, keep busy on, on other projects, and we could support some of these projects to lighten their workload a bit. Along the way, as I said, we're ensuring to just coordinate very closely to make sure that any decisions that we make are consistent with the, the same policies and decisions that would be made by Jacksonville District. So, so basically, we're helping to uh, support their really heavy workload 
um, since these studies were focused on coastal storms, something that the Jacksonville District has a lot of work in that area. You know, in the middle of all this, the one thing that we all couldn't plan for would be a global pandemic uh, hitting as we're, we're putting all this together. Uh, how much of a challenge has it become to to do the process of these studies and, and get the public feedback um, as, as we have the social distancing um, and the inability to actually go face to face with folks? Um, you know, talk to me some of the challenges that, that, that have, have popped up that we're overcoming. So I actually think our teams have done a phenomenal job of stepping up and ensuring um, a high level of public and agency participation despite the um, the need to social distance and the inability to get together in person. Um, so really just, for example, our public meetings, normally we would have at least one and perhaps several public meetings in person somewhere within the project area. So you've had to replace those, but we've done that by having multiple virtual meetings for each project. Um, for example, Miami-Dade, we've already been through those public meetings and we had two um, two two hour public virtual webinars, um, one during the day and one in the evening. And in addition to that, we had two sets of office hours where members of the public could call in and ask our technical team members who were all on the line questions directly. Um, they could provide they could provide informal comments. Um, all formal comments had to be submitted in writing, but they could um, they could tell us their concerns and they could ask us questions so that we could clarify the study. So we've been able to to do those. In addition, the team has spent a lot of time uh, doing community outreach. So, for example, in Miami Dade, there are over 30 municipalities, and the team has done virtual webinars to both staff and see council members to many of those localities. The same thing in the Florida Keys, there are five different municipalities outside of the, or, or included within the county, uh, but that function as their own municipalities. And we've bri briefed both of the staff and the city council or the commission level at all of those municipalities multiple times. So I think as our society has moved to Zoom and Skype and different types of um, of communication tools. I think our Corps of Engineers team, along with our local sponsors, have very um, uh, have done a great job of moving over to those types of communication. And I, th I think we've done a good job, um, given the constraints that we have, of, of providing the information to the public and allowing them to provide input, um, you know, as well as we can not being there in person. In some ways, I think it, we could be reaching more folks because we have had folks call into our public meetings and say, hey, I might not have shown up in person, <clears throat> but because this is, uh, you know, over the phone and a webinar, I, I was able to, to call in and participate. So I think in some cases, the outreach is, has worked even better than if we had done our traditional public meeting format. And, and Holly, for you, I know that one of the things that the project manager is really, you know, concerned about is obviously the timelines and, and the funding piece, you know, uh, as far as, you know, timelines are concerned, how has the, the, uh, the the pandemic impacted impacted you? Um, yes, yeah, so of course I am concerned about both those things. Um, I think as far as timeline, we, we have had some delays in releasing the report. You know, the, the actual release, we were hoping to be a little bit earlier this spring, but with everything going on, we held on to it a little bit longer. But we, we aren't expecting any overall timeline issues with this. Um, we're gonna stick to our three year timeline, which is great news. Um, you know, the team's willing to put in the work um, to make up any any time that we lost with the release of the report, um, trying to, you know, work around all of the issues that are occurring this year. Um, and then as far as budget, we're, we're in good shape. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think there's really cost savings because I would say we've probably participated in even more outreach virtually than we would have done in person. So we have some travel savings. But as Susan said, the team has been spending a tremendous amount of time communicating um, with agencies, with local stakeholders, and with the municipalities within Miami-Dade County, um, and, and all that's going really well. So, so there's trade-offs, but but at the end of the day, I, I think we have been very successful in the virtual coordination that we've been able to execute this spring and, and summer. If I could just add um, one thing about the the dealing with the COVID, we did recently receive a request for an extension to our public comment period 
for the Miami-Dade Back Bay report. And this is something that normally uh, we are reluctant to approve extensions because we do work on very stringent timelines and we have limited time for, for each step in the process along the way. But because we are in such unprecedented times and our non-federal sponsor really felt like they and the stakeholders in the Miami-Dade County area are currently being hit particularly hard with the, the COVID um, issue and the pandemic that, um, that they really felt like they needed additional time to be able to process because it is such a complex project. So we did approve that 30-day timeline. So I think we are trying as a core to maintain business as usual and execute our plan. I'm still acknowledging that there are some things that we may need to adjust in order to account for, you know, what's happening globally. So, you know, we're trying to balance that, and I, I think we're doing the best job we can moving forward. And for those who are, are specifically interested in each one of the projects, uh, we are, if you check out the, the show notes at the bottom of, of wherever you're, you're downloading it from, uh, we are including the links to each one of the projects, uh, Miami-Dade, Back Bay, the Florida Keys, Monroe County, Florida study, as well as the Collier County study. Um, ladies, is there anything else that you want to add that I may have forgotten to ask? So we, we talked a lot about the, the process and, and like you said Patrick you'll provide the links to our plans um, so I would encourage everyone to, to visit and take a look at all, all of the coordination and, and I just want to add that we have been working really closely with Miami-Dade County through this process um, and we look forward to continuing our great relationship with the sponsor there. And I would reiterate that on the, the Florida Keys and the Collier County as well it's certainly been a um, interesting experience and uh, something our team is proud of that we've been able to support the projects and um, certainly we have draft reports out we'll have final reports out in the spring of 2021 and the way our planning process works now the the, the projects continue to evolve quite a bit until the final report um, so the teams are still working hard we still have another um, over a year of analysis to complete to get the, to those final recommendations. Um, and we look forward to having the signed chief's report in September of 2021. Before we head into our small business segment with Sherry Coons, I wanted to take this moment to thank all the folks who made this episode possible because you and I both know no one listens to the credits. In no specific order, we'd like to thank Sherry Coons, Erica Sparkman, Doug Hessler, Susan Layton, Holly Carpenter. If you are listening and watching the YouTube version of this episode, you'll notice that we did have video to go along with the GIS innovation segment. We created that with the works of Julie Shoemaker, Chief Petty Officer Barry Riley, U.S. Army Corporal Rachel Thicklin, U.S. Air National Guard Senior Airman Valerie Lopez, as well as the wonderful work from some of our sister districts, New York, Vicksburg, Omaha, Huntsville. Thanks for uploading all that fantastic imagery for us to use. Oh, didn't know that was a thing. Didn't know I could do that, so... <laughs> yeah. The good and the bad, but um, yeah. What I was really thinking, and we I kind of touched on it in the email, is just um to to take a look at what the Norfolk District and the Army Corps of Engineers look like of a small business office. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. So um, the purpose of the small business um position that I hold is to be an advocate for small businesses. So um, what we do is each time we have a requirement, we look at the requirement and see uh, the best way to um, award a contract, whether it be to a large or a small business that will meet the customer's needs. In going out to um, the industry uh, through a source of thought, letting them know that we have this requirement, then we can find out what other companies are out there that can do the work. Most of the work that we do um, is a new requirement. For instance, we do a lot of construction 
at all the local um, installations around. And most of the work we do, is it's the first time we're, you know, fixing the bridge or building a new building um, or repairing another building, et cetera. Um, we do some repetitive work, but it's a very small percentage of our overall program. So by advertising out to the industry, um, they can let us know that they're available and what their capabilities are so that we can get the best contractor for our customers at the best price. So really it's, um, it's beneficial to us co cost wise. Um, what would you say is the benefit for those small businesses in, in um, joining us in that work and, and being connected with the Corps of Engineers? So by having an advocate for them, um, it helps to, uh, if you will, level the playing field. Um, and I would explain that by um, when we go out to do a source of thought, say we have a project in, um, at one of our installations and we do a source of thought and we find out that there are a lot of small businesses that can do the work. Um, if we have two or more small businesses, then we will consider setting the, the project aside for a small business set aside, which means that only small businesses can then compete for the project. If we didn't do the source of thought and we didn't ever have a small business set aside, then the small businesses would have to compete with the large businesses on every project. Um, and as we all know, a big conglomerate is going to be more economical than a small business that's coming out. So by having the set aside, it helps to level the playing field and give those small businesses a chance to compete for the work. And um, there are different different kinds of small businesses. Can you talk to us a bit about that? Sure. Um, I think you're referring to the uh, socioeconomic categories that, yes, are under, yes. Yeah, that are under the small business umbrella. So there is small business, which um, somebody can be just a small business. In addition to that, there's additional categories that small businesses can fall into. Um, one could be a woman-owned small business. Another one could be a small disadvantaged business. We also have small disadvantaged veteran-owned small business. Uh, and then there's also hub zone. And for those ca uh, socioeconomic categories under the small business umbrella, when we go out and we do a source of sought, um, if there are two or more small businesses, we will consider doing a small business set aside. If there are two or more woman-owned small businesses, then we will consider going down a little bit further and setting it aside for a woman-owned small business. Now, the, the regulations tell us that two or more requires the contracting officer to consider it. There may be some other extenuating factors as to why it makes sense to keep it as a small business set aside as opposed to just a woman owned or a small disadvantage business. And um, a lot of times that has to do with um, the competition, um, some nuances to the project that we're aware of from our customer that it may make it a little bit more difficult or we may need a little bit more uh, specialized experience that maybe that smaller socioeconomic category does not have. And in that case, the contracting officer is required to document that they did consider a woman-owned small business based on the responses to the sources sought, but that they thought it was better to keep it at the small business set aside level to allow not only women owned small businesses, but every type of small business to uh, submit on the job and therefore giving us a, a larger uh, a, a base of contractors and po possibly getting a better submittal. So the Norfolk District and the Army Corps of Engineers is actively seeking to and use the term advocate for small businesses. Um, what what projects do we have going on now with some of our small businesses that you could think of off the top of your head? So um, every month we have what's called a project delivery board meeting. Um, and every month we have 
uh, folks from our field offices brief on those projects. So we currently have small businesses working at every one of our uh, local installations. Um, we have folks work working at Fort Lee, AP Hill, DSCR, uh, Fort Eustis, uh, Langley Resident Office, uh, the Northern Virginia Area Office, et cetera. So those are ongoing projects that are being um, constructed by both large and small businesses. So if a small business is interested in hearing about upcoming work, the best way for them to do that is to go to beta.sam.gov, um, that's B-E-T-A dot S-A-M dot G-O-V. And that is the um, main uh, point of contact for the government that replaced um, Fed Biz Ops, Federal Business Opportunities. So every uh, project that is advertised not only by the Corps, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, et cetera, is going to be advertised on beta.sam.gov website. Now, a small business may not be able to provide either the bonding or may not have the ability to build a hospital or renovate an entire uh, road or something along those lines. But what they can do is go to the projects that they're interested in, and then there will be a list of the interested bidders. So the large businesses who are considering bidding on them are going to be listed there. And a small business can reach out to that large and let them know their capabilities and could possibly become part of the project as a subcontractor. Almost helping them network. Exactly, exactly. Um, and in addition to that, our, every organization, including the Corps of Engineers in Norfolk, um, as well as all the other 43 districts, post our workload on our website. We route, update it, I would say, every two to three months on our website. So if someone were to Google Norfolk District Corps of Engineers, it's going to come up to our homepage, and then there's going to be a link for doing business with us. And then you're going to see a contracting link and also a small business link. And under the small business is where the workload projection for what we have coming up um, is going to be listed. Another way that small businesses can find out about what's going on is we are going to be doing an industry day on July 30th. It's going to be virtual. And we're going to be presenting probably by WebEx all of our upcoming work for the remainder of this fiscal year and what we know of already for the following year. Because of COVID-19, we have not been out publicly interacting with contractors at industry days and other events that we would normally be doing because of the ongoing um, health challenges. But we wanted to let contractors know that there are still a lot of opportunities, not only here in Norfolk, but you could go to any webpage um, and see their workload. In, um, in Norfolk, as of last month, we still have 152 actions to complete. So what that means is some of them are going to be standalone jobs that are going to be advertised on beta.sam.gov. Some of those are going to be mods to existing contracts. And obviously, those wouldn't be out for bid because we already have a prime contractor doing the work. And some of that work will be task orders under existing IDIQs. Again, uh, we won't be looking for bids on that. But beta.sam.gov website is the best place for contractors to go. Also, um, something that they may um, small businesses may want to consider is when there's going to be an industry day, we typically post it on beta.sam.gov, and then we use what's called Eventbrite to do the registration. So another place that contractors might want to look for an opportunity to network their capabilities and to meet larger primes would to familiarize yourself with Eventbrite and see if there's any upcoming local activities because you can, um, on your uh, query, you can search for stuff just in the Hampton Roads area, be it Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Portsmouth, et cetera. So that's also a great way for firms to find out about what's going on. I mentioned the uh, event on July 30th, which is going to be a virtual event. 
But in addition to that, we're going to be doing a Arlington National Cemetery Industry Day. And that's going to be held up in the Arlington area at a local hotel. It is going to be an in-person event, and it's going to be open to contractors who might be interested in working at Arlington National Cemetery, whether it be as a prime holder of a contract or as a subcontractor. So again, another opportunity to, as a small business, um, meet the large primes that typically work in this area, and obviously at Arlington, to meet them and to hear about you know, other opportunities that you could take part in. So what we'll do is we can put all of those links uh, down in our show notes so the folks listening at home can have them right there for them to uh, to access after the show. Okay, wonderful. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention, I know this was important to Colonel Kinsman, for the last three years, we have been tracking new contractors that get their first-time award. In 2018, the first year that I took over in the position, we awarded to nine new firms. So what that means is nine firms who had not previously worked for Norfolk District received their first award. There are are, are several different ways that you can receive your first award, and mostly they're done by competitive awards. So for instance, when we um, advertise a job, we were um, having new firms, in some cases, receive the award. So we decided it was a good idea to track Um, how often we award to a new contractor. The numbers have grown. In uh, 2019, we awarded to 12 uh, new contractors. And this year so far, in fiscal year 20, we've awarded to six, but we still have several more months to go. Some of those awards could be a sole source award, but very few of them are done as a sole source. The majority of our new contractors or first-time awardees as we refer to them, are done through competitive acquisitions. You're setting the bar higher and higher each year for yourself, Sherry. That's great. We're trying, and um, I'd like to think I'm improving every year, so (laughs) getting better. (laughs) Um, I would like to stress that we have a very vibrant small business program in Norfolk District. Um, As a district, we take the small business uh, regulations and goals very seriously. In uh, fiscal year 19, um, and Andy, you probably have those statistics in a previous brochure, but um, we were very successful and we exceeded all of our goals. In fact, we kind of blew them out of the water in some cases. And so we're very proud of that fact. And that takes a whole team of folks. That takes um, not only the small business specialists, I'm just the lucky one who gets to report it. That takes a team of technical folks, of contracting folks, project managers, right on up to Colonel Kinsman and also our customers to get the word out that Norfolk District is definitely interested in working with small businesses to meet our our customers' needs um, and that it's a, a great place to work if you are a small business. of the episode, you're probably like, wow, I want to work for the Corps of Engineers. Well, you're in luck because we're heading into our Great Places to Work segment. Each month, we bring you a list of jobs for which we're actively hiring, as well as a list of the websites to go to if you're going to be looking for a a job with us in the future. For this month, one of our featured jobs is an engineering equipment operator helper. This job is a WG 5 through 11. It is a full-time permanent position and the location is Portsmouth, Virginia. This job announcement closes July 14th. For the link to the announcement on USA Jobs, go to our careers page on our website. That information is down in the show notes. But you don't need to wait for our next episode of Core Talk to see future job announcements. Remember to go to our Facebook, Twitter, and to visit our website. All those links are in the show notes. All right, folks, we are close, so close to finishing this episode. It is now time for news from around the district. And this month, 
with all the exciting stuff we have going on, we only really have two major news bits for you. The first one is Gathrite Dam Pulse release schedule has been released itself and that's available on our website. You're going to go to the media tab from the homepage, scroll down to news stories, click on news stories, and you'll see that article halfway down the page. The other major item for this month is mosquito spraying dates. Yes, it's that time of year again. We are starting our aerial mosquito treatment over federal property on Craney Island. We will continue to have updates on our website, our Facebook, and our Twitter, but you can also call the Portsmouth Mosquito Hotline at 757-393-8666. All right, that's it. That's all for this episode of Core Talk. Thanks so much for tuning in. We're looking forward to bringing you yet another month of all the people, programs, and projects of the Norfolk District. But until then, this is Core Talk. Core Talk is the official podcast of the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Submitting emails or voicemails to Core Talk constitutes permission to use that content as part of the broadcast. Core Talk is recorded at the Norfolk District Headquarters building in Norfolk, Virginia, and is produced by the district's public affairs staff. 